Hello and welcome back to Introductory Financial Accounting. Anything look a little bit different? Well, today we are talking about one of, <laughs> if not my favorite topic, cash. I'm gonna need some volunteers. In fact, everybody that's listening, you have been voluntold. Now, your choice. You can either be a good person or a villain. All right, if you chose to be a good person, your role is going to be as bank manager. You are responsible for keeping this giant trolley of cash safe. And who are you keeping it safe from? The villain. That's the bad guy, the bad person, the uh, bank robber. So if you chose to be a villain, you are the bank robber. And yep, you guessed it. You are trying to get this stack of cash from the bank manager. All right, so I ask you, um, bank robber, what are you going to do? How are you going to try to take this cash? Have some ideas. All right, bank manager, I hope you were anticipating how this thief is going to try to take this cash, and I want, to, I want you to tell me, what are the list of things that you're going to do? Well, the last time I did this in person, the people, uh, the bank managers they, and participants in the classroom said that they would put it in a vault. Love it. Um, and then ask the bank robber, what are you going to do? And they're like, I'm going to go in the vault. All right. Back to the manager. What are you going to do? I'm going to lock the vault. Love it. <laughs> bank uh, thief, what are you going to do? I'm going to unlock the vault. I'm going to get, I'm going to start being an employee or I'm going to start bribing the employees. Oh my goodness. All right, so things are starting to get serious. All right, um, I then said, well, what are you gonna do, bank manager? Assuming uh, that that might actually work. And they said, okay, I am going to move the cash to a secure site. All right, and then the bank thief said, I'm gonna get the, bank, the cash um, while it's in transit. Bank manager, you're up. I'm gonna insure the cash. And that way the insurance company will help me um, so I'm going to use a portion of this cash and I'm going to buy insurance and the insurance company will help me transport it and be safe. All right, the teams are getting bigger. The thief? The thief chose to hire some additional thieves from the class and also try to infiltrate, but this time the insurance company is going to be uh, extra safe. So we went back and forth and back and forth and all of this before the lecture already started because guess what? This is the lecture. Cash is cash, and cash is something that we can relate to. It's not just a number on a sheet, although I tell you, when I'm dealing with like billions of dollars <laughs> and looking at that, I kind of think of it as a number on a sheet. But really, it's no different whether you're accounting for $1, a $1 million, or a $1 billion or more. We need to have controls over cash. It is highly susceptible to theft. It is, uh, it is liquid. It is first on the balance sheet for a reason, right? Cash is first place. In this chapter, we're going to look at internal control in cash. And we're going to look at various ways in which companies can keep cash safe. However, I will say that this can be a very uh, theoretical chapter. Or it can be a very applied chapter chapter. I think of internal controls and cash uh, like I have a good angel on the shoulder and a bad angel. And it just depends. If I'm trying to think about how to keep the cash safe, I'm thinking like a bank manager. And if I'm trying to think about uh, oh, how is it susceptible to theft, I'm thinking like a bank thief. And I wear both hats so that I can keep the cash safe for the company. All right, so we're going to talk about a couple learning objectives. Uh, kudos to the two students who reached out to me uh, last week and the week before uh, who asked about this. Yes, when I strike out a learning objective, it means that all or most of it isn't examinable. And that's per the course outline. However, you are still responsible for reading all of the uh, course outline because it might have like a page or two on either end of the learning objective. It just means that I won't devote one or more uh, videos to it. So if you're not concerned, if you're like, I just want to get like <laughs> the major parts of 
the course, uh, I'm not worried about an extra page or two here or there, then you're cool to stick with um, reading the same learning objectives and watching the same videos. And honestly, it's, it's like probably more than 98%. I just really want to encourage you to take to ownership of your studies uh, in this course like you would of any other course. All right, without further ado, learning objective number one, uh, explaining the components of an internal control system, including its control activities and limitations, i.e., what do we do to stop or pre try to prevent that and why it doesn't always work. Goodness, anybody recall in the news like six months ago, maybe a year ago, how at Pearson International there was a gold heist? Anyways, controls are important and controls fail. So when looking at internal controls, these are the systems that are adopted within a company to help it keep finan uh, reliable financial reporting, have both effective and efficient operations, for example, we're not going to, uh, you know, put each dollar bill in its own separate safe because that wouldn't be cost efficient or cost effective and that wouldn't be an efficient use of resources. So we have to kind of balance risk and reward here. Absolutely need to do so in compliance with relevant laws and regulations. Can't just put it all in Bitcoin if that's not, um, kudos, if that's not cool with your uh, company charter uh, or your laws of your country. Uh, we have controls to help us prevent and so protect, prevent theft uh, and detect errors. So, you know, if you have an alarm on your bank vault, uh, it's an alarm on its own might act as a deterrent to prevent theft, uh, but it also might help you detect it. So a deterrent to prevent and an element to say, hey, uh, something has gone on in here. You better check it out. All right. And so we're always looking at that cost benefit, effective ways to both prevent and detect fraud. Cool, cool, cool. All right. As well, we are looking at all of these elements in the five primary components. We have the control environment. What does the environment look like? You know, is it organized? Um, are there signs that say beware of dog in <laughs> the bank vault? Um, you know, has there been a regular assessment of risks? Do we know what could go wrong here? Anybody that works at EY will likely, um, that's like a very EY term, what could go wrong? Um, and that's really what I say in my head um, as an alumni, uh, when I think about risk, what could go wrong? All right, control activities. What are elements in place that we can do to um, put appropriate controls in place? We'll talk about all these in a moment. Um, information and communication systems, as well as monitoring activities. So when you think about the bank I want you to, as we go through each one of these bullet points in the subsequent slides, so this acts kind of like a little um, mini table of contents for the rest of the learning um, objective, number one. As we go through each one of these in the subsequent slides, I want you to think about that giant stack of cash and your role as either the bank manager or the bank thief. All right, let's look at the first one. Control activities. So to have our, oh, I just want to make sure, yeah, control activities to make sure that we are having an appropriate um, set of controls in place, we can assign responsibility. So for example, you can assign um, responsibility of the cash safety to specific employees, making them accountable for carrying out a task appropriately. Uh, for example, in a bank, you might have that big stack of cash. Uh, there might be some of the vaults and then there might be some with each of the tellers and each uh, bank teller cashier is responsible for their own cash drawer. All right, you might also have a segregation of duty control. This is where you have somebody responsible for authorization and recording of transactions. And then the custody of the assets should be to different individuals. So for example, uh, that might mean that while 
each of the cashiers are responsible for authorizing and recording transactions. Uh, you know, for example, um, with uh, their clients, with the customers, uh, then maybe when they need a big amount of cash that's outside of their drawer, uh, they would have to ask their bank manager to get that extra cash from the bank vault. So, you know, if they can have a little amount, that's kind of like an immaterial amount. And then they get, um, you know, a giant, giant sum from the bank manager that has to come through, as well as you could have documentation. So evidence that the transaction and event has occurred at a specific time and specific place at the bank. When you go in and you withdraw the money, the documentation could be something like you signing something, you putting in your bank card uh, information and putting in um, the pin and then kind of signing something at the end. And then on their end, they're also making documentation um, and keeping account of all of those records. Uh, physical controls. Uh, there was a bank heist in Calgary uh, a number of years ago. Uh, it was near, like literally uh, half a block away from my house. It was like right across the alley. And um, they had some die packs that went in the, um, the cash bags that the bank robbers got. So um, while there was physical controls in place, um, you know, it, because there was an inside job, and we'll talk about that in a moment, um, at least after, so the cash bundles were there, and once the bank robbers took apart the cash bundles, there was the um, the die pack that kind of exploded. So, I mean, was it a perfect physical control? No, because the cash like left. Um, however, it kind of goes to the other side of it. Um, the police were able to identify and detect uh, the bank robbers because they're like, well, you were in the bank at the time of the theft and now you have blue dye all over you. So, uh, interesting. Uh, review and reconciliation. So reconciliation involves the comparison between two or more documents, that is um, reconciling these matters. And this will be a special topic that we're gonna cover in our last video today. All right, let's give this a go. Let us see um, if we can match each of the following control activities with its appropriate description. So friendly reminder to pause the video, and when you come back, we will uh, match these up and talk about it. Talk to you soon. All right, welcome back. Not exactly Excel, but we were having some technical difficulties, so we're just gonna go in my editor and do it this way. All right, so looking at number one, which type of control activity is when you have all transactions and they should include the original and detailed receipts? Well, if you said documentation, you would be correct. So let's put that in here. Of course, what I tested out right before we went live isn't working. All right, there we go, number three. Cool, let's move on to the next one. All right, one second. Undeposited cash should be stored in the company's safe. If you said physical control, then you are correct. Awesome, awesome work. Surprise cash counts are performed by internal audit. That's gonna be review and reconciliation. So in two separate people count, what do you actually have? What do you say you have? That's gonna be review and reconciliation. Resp responsibility for related activities should be assigned to specific employees. Assignment of responsibility, absolutely, number one. All right, and by process of elimination, or um, you know, just pure smartness, check signers are not allowed to record cash transactions. Segregation of duties, that's right, the same person doing the thing shouldn't be the same person uh, recording the thing. All right, how'd you do? That's not the last part of the video. The last part of the video has to do with controls. And we talked about cash first because, well, that's a big part of our job as accountants is making sure that the lifeblood of a company uh, is A-OK. -okay. And it's one of my favorite topics. However, you can apply controls to anything. Just think, what can go wrong? That is, do a risk, a risk assessment and then apply it to whatever context you want. 
Uh, sometimes uh, candidates or students will apply to their studies. Uh, what could go wrong in this course? Well, I could not understand a topic and be tested on it and do poorly on a test. Uh, what could go wrong? I could sleep in for a test. What could go wrong? I could book something and expect to do my test after and not have enough time to do it or something could go wrong with that activity. So we have a lot of risks in any sort of activity. And so the controls are put into place to address those risk assessments. When thinking about a movie theater, oh my gosh, I just have to share this with you. Um, my friend sent me this link the other day and uh, for like two seconds, one of our former colleague who we articled with uh, forever ago uh, was on the news and he looks the exact same. We're like, oh my gosh. Like anyways, it's just, it's fabulous um, because you could, and he sounds the exact same as somebody that we, uh, neither one of us had talked to since we articled back in the day. So anyways, and I bring it up because he's uh, the president of a, um, a theater. Uh, so president of Landmark, I believe, cinemas. So anyways, <laughs> I'm talking about Taylor Swift, too Swift. Okay, so what are some control activities uh, that Dave Cohen would have um, in place for Landmark cinemas? Sure. Okay, well, first we have to think of what could go wrong. And so what could go wrong? Um, maybe people would try to uh, sneak into the theater system. So get into the theater without paying for tickets. So that's why you have, um, you know, somebody selling the tickets and then somebody else checking the tickets and probably somebody else counting the money from the sales and reconciling the, um, the sales versus the number of people in the theater. So I just threw a bunch of things at you. Let's think about it. Part of that is a segregation of duties. You have a different person selling the tickets and collecting the cash and a different person checking the tickets. That also helps. And then maybe you have the bank, uh, no bank, theater manager go in and count all the heads of the people in the theater and then see are there fewer or equal number of heads to uh, in the theater as there are for ticket sales for that time. Also, what happens if there's fewer heads? Is that a bad thing? No, um, it means you have more money than you have like people in chairs and somebody might be in the washroom. Okay, so nothing went wrong there. Or maybe somebody walked in, was like, huh, this isn't the Barbie movie and walked out. You know, like you, you never know. All right, um, you might, what else could go wrong? People could steal your snacks. Those snacks um, cost very little but are sold for a lot. Um, I don't know how much because I like cash and I don't like candy at movie theaters enough to spend my cash on that. All right. Um, so what do they do if um, I wasn't, if I was the, you know, the uh, candy thief? Well, you have them behind, you have access, you have physical controls in place, you have them behind a counter, um, and then you have somebody responsible for, you know, selling the candy. So you have multiple controls in place to prevent the candy thieves from getting that. All right, I am gonna do what all, all students hate professors doing, but I'm going to do it, I'm gonna ask for forgiveness. And that is, I'm gonna talk briefly, one slide, about non-examinable, non-examinable <laughs> materials. And that is limitations of internal controls. I bring this up because I don't know how we can talk about con internal controls without talking about their limitations. People, um, shit will go wrong at some point. Um, and the limitation, somebody will steal something. You know, um, your employees who are in charge of safeguarding the popcorn might eat the popcorn, okay? So, uh, and then their other employee that's meant to count the popcorn might not tell on you, that's collusion. There might be an error. Somebody might drop the popcorn and not want to count it because they're like, oh shoot, I dropped popcorn last time. I don't want to be in trouble. Um, there might be management overrides. You know, somebody is obviously not under 14, but wants to get into the 14 and under, um, you know, cost price at a theater, because I'm pretty sure that there's like a different price if you're under a certain age, you know, and the manager is like, you know what, like, I don't want to fight with you. Um, like, let's just let this six foot four, um, 14 year old into the theater. Cool, whatever. Um, cost benefit. Again, you cannot spend more protecting the item than um, the item costs, really, like in theory, unless you're trying to like set the tone for multiple instances going forward. You're not going to um, 
you know, with respect to $10, you're not going to spend $20 trying to um, safeguard it. So, you know, it needs to be reasonable uh, and measured. It's not going to be perfect. I am really interested to know what happens um, when more reporting comes out from the Pearson Gold um, heist that happened at the Pearson Airport. I'm wondering, you know, which one um, of these limitations came into play. Uh, and typically what you end up seeing is that there's, um, you know, oftentimes collusion because you can't provide pro protect against collusion and uh, sometimes some human error in there. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I will see you in the next video.